we are so excited to start this new series called habit how many of you are excited about this amen habits is something that we all develop um, it's something that it's part and parcel of our lives and um, we've been thinking about you know uh, different uh, things in the past couple of months we started with uh, a series called go higher how God wants to go higher but if we need to go higher we need to grow deeper with God and that's the only way we can go higher with God and over the months we've been learning on different things but at this point in season of our church I believe that God has this word for us and it's gonna bless your life this series will focus on how we can create small and simple disciplines spiritual disciplines that will shape our life can we reduce the volume of this mic a little thank you small and simple disciplines that will shape our lives we uh, as we continue to you know reflect on the word we will learn that how the small changes that we make will bring the big result a lot of times we are after the big result a lot of times we are after the big thing that's happening but we are not even ready to make the small changes that we have to make in our lives so we're gonna learn in the next couple of weeks how we can grow spiritually by developing a good godly discipline so keep coming don't miss any Sunday keep coming I know we have it on YouTube a lot of people are, oh, we, miss it. We, can, we can watch it on YouTube but try to come, you know, try to come every Sunday and we can learn together. This series is actually based on a teaching series by Pastor Craig Groeschel from Life Church. So I want to give credit to him. And as well as there are a couple of books uh, that uh, I have referred on that will also enable you. So if you want to write down the names and the authors, titles of these books that might help you. Uh, Power of Habits by uh, Charles Higg. Power of Habits by Charles Higg, uh, Compound Effect by Darren Hardy, um, and Atomic Habits by James Clear. Atomic Habits by James Clear. There's like hundreds of books out there on this subject and on this concept, but uh, these three things, uh, these three books have been really useful. I want us to say this out loud. Okay, are you ready? I want you to repeat after me. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. If you want to write this down, you can write this down. A lot of times, we want to see results, we want to see success in our lives, but then it is only a dream. So many of us, we start the new year, you know, with a lot of resolutions, with a lot of decisions, and we say, okay, this year, I'm going to do this for God. And we always try to start something spiritually so that we are on the safe side, because we are always taught that we need to put God first. So we don't think about ourselves first. We first say, okay, I'm going to increase my prayer life this year. I'm going to increase my Bible reading this year. I'm going to do this. Then we think about, you know, uh, our health. I'm going to be, you know, uh, do something uh, for my fitness. I'm, I want to feel healthy. Then another common decision everybody would make is finances. I want to be wise in my finances. I want to be wise in how I spend my money. So a lot of different areas we try to, you know, decide and we try to start a new pattern, a new habit. And how many of you are successful? Sometimes we don't even, if I go around asking, do you remember the resolution you made at the beginning of this year? It's like, yeah, it's somewhere. I wrote it down somewhere, pastor. I don't even remember. We are not able to fulfill those, uh, you know, resolutions. And the reason is, uh, it, the most of the times, we are not prepared to put down the habit that will help us to reach the success we need to reach. We watch a lot of successful people. You see footballers and you see their celebrity lifestyle and you see their cars, you see the blings they wear, you see the brands they wear and, and you are after those brands. You are after those, uh, you know, after the life that they are living. But you didn't watch when those people were not, 
yet in the pitch. You didn't see the hard life they went through. You didn't see their practice sessions. You didn't know what time they had to wake up and work out and work hard in order to get where they want to get. Once I was in a Hillsong conference in the year 2010 and there was a worship leader who came there and he was sharing his experience. And he was, uh, every time, you know, he goes out and leads worship. He's, you know, he's leading worship all across the globe, standing in different platforms, you know, thousands of people worshiping God. And whenever he posts a picture of that, he always receives a comment saying, oh, uh, we wish or I wish I can have a life like you. Oh, I wish we had this. But then on a Sunday morning, he serves in his local church and this is what happens in his local church his local church doesn't have a permanent place so they meet in a theater that has 3,000 seats and every Sunday morning they have to come and set up the church so they have a setting up team they have the media team they have a sound team and they have over 300 volunteers and you know what what time the first service is the first service is at 8 a.m. And you know what time they have to come and set up? At 5 a.m. Yes, I said 5 a.m. That's probably when most of you are going to bed on a Saturday night. 5 a.m. Which means the team has to come. And this worship leader, he lives in the outskirts of the city. And it takes him almost 45 minutes to drive to where he needs to come which means he has to leave at 4 a.m. if he needs to leave at 4 a.m. his pastor has said before you leave home you need to spend some time in prayer even before you get to church even before you come to serve God which means that he has to wake up at 3 a.m. have a time of prayer get ready start driving at 4 so that he can be at church for 5 so every time when he does that he gets into his car at 4 a.m. He takes a picture of an empty road and puts it on Instagram saying, I get to serve God this morning. It's 4 a.m. and I'm going and I'm looking forward to see what God is about to do. Nobody ever posts a comment saying that I want this life. Hello? Everybody wants the attractive part. Nobody wants to make the sacrifice. Today we live a lifestyle where we are constantly fed by the highlights of people. You open so many social media pages, you see all their statuses, you see all the, uh, the way they live and everything and you look at only the highlights but you don't know what is happening behind those highlights. But this morning, what God is calling us, uh, calling to do as a church is not to just dream by looking at other people's highlights, but to go into God's word and find out and discover what God has for your life. Amen. Are you ready to do that with me? Jesus, he never said, I don't have time to pray. He never said, I am busy in ministry. Jesus, in fact, had the busiest ministry. He was going around healing the sick, resurrecting people. He had the busiest time in his time of ministry. But Jesus never said, I don't have time to pray. In fact, he had a habit of going away from the crowd and always making time to speak to his heavenly father. Paul had a habit. He had a habit of going to the temple and praying. And he always preached at the doors of the synagogues and the temples. He had a habit. What is our habit? Sean Covey says, our habits will make us or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. Our habits will make us or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. Romans chapter 7, verse 15, 18, 19, 24, and 25. This is what Paul says. I don't really understand myself. This is how he starts. I don't really understand myself. For, I want, for what I want to do is right. But I don't do it. Does this sound familiar to you? Story of your life? Mine too. For what I want to do, 
and what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. You want to overcome a sin. You want to overcome an addiction. You want to overcome, you know, your laziness. You want to overcome procrastination. You want to overcome, you know, overeating. You want to overcome all these things. But you end up doing exactly what you want to overcome. You hate doing it, but you end up doing it. And verse 18, he says, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. We are in this boat. Paul was, you know, he was in this boat. He was going through this struggle. And verse 24, he says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. And now he's hosting a self-pity party for himself. He's saying, oh, I wanted to do all these things. I'm not able to do it. What a miserable person I am. Goes around probably telling hundreds of people, I feel so miserable today. So that people will, you know, encourage, oh, no, it's fine. Even if you don't do it, you can try another day. You can do this. You can do that. You're better at this. You're probably not good at this, but you're better at that. People will make him feel better. And he continues to say, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? But here comes verse 25. Here comes the hope. He says, thank God the answer is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. How many of you are happy that we have all the answers in Jesus Christ? Amen. I used to do this when I was in Bible college. Whenever they ask us a question in class, if we don't know the answer, we just shout Jesus. The teacher can't say it's a wrong answer because he is the answer for everything. That's what the Bible says. But if you want to experience everything that God has for your life, if you want to experience that success that you're longing for, we need to understand why do we fail? Why do we fail? The title of my uh, sermon this morning is Who Before Do? Who Before Do? We're going to look at three reasons why we don't succeed. Number one, we focus on the what but we don't understand the how. So many times we focus on what we need to get rid of. We focus on what we need to do, but we don't know the how. If I go across this room and take a survey of, you know, what are your life goals? What goals do you have? Most of the people will have a very similar life goal. It will start with something spiritual. It will start with something uh, in order, uh, regarding your health something regarding your finances, something regarding relationships. Most of the goals fall under these four categories. But if I take a survey of the results of your goals, everybody's result is very different, even though you have similar goals. Why are the results different? What are we doing different? Just because you set a goal doesn't determine your success. Your goal will never determine your success, but the system that you put in place will determine your success. Just because you have amazing goals written down, that's not going to, you know, help for you to be successful. In fact, in fact uh, James Clear, he says, you don't rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. You don't race to the level of your goals just because you wake up one morning and say, from today onwards, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to work out. I've been saying that for a couple of years. But I didn't put a system in place to make sure that happens. Just because I have a goal and I look at the goal every day, that is not going to shape me. That is not going to get me fit. But what is my habit? What is my system? What is the small difference that I'm making every day in order to get where I need to go? If you're running an organization, if, you, if it's a family, what goals do you have in place for your family? What goals do you have in place for your marriage, for your children, for your finances, 
for your spiritual life. You can write down all those goals. But on the other side, you need to write down the system that you're going to put in place for those goals to be fulfilled. Because you will not rise to the level of your goal. You will fall to the level of the system that you put in place. That is why you see Daniel, he was thrown into the lion's den. And he was not waiting to have a revival prayer time or a war room prayer time in the lion's den. He already had a system. He had a system of praying three times a day. No matter what happens, no matter what the law of the country was, no matter what the king said, his life was driven by a system, by a simple habit that he had. No matter what, this is how I will live my life. He had a system in place. So when he faced with trials, when he faced with challenges, it was those prayer times that carried him through. Even when he was in the lion's den, it didn't matter. When it was prayer time, I bet he was praying. And God took care of the lions. What is your system? What is your godly habit that you are developing in order to see all that God has in store for your life? In order to experience all the promises that's there in the Bible. We are not here to just clap and praise God and say, Oh, God is so good, you know, for He knows the plans that He has, for I know the plans that He has for me, says the Lord. Plans to give me hope, a great future. Promises are great. But what are we doing in our everyday life to see His hope, to experience His hope? We need to change our systems. If our habits are not working, we need to change that. So the first problem that we are not successful is because we focus so much on the what and not on the how. And the second reason is, this is a problem that we all, the reason we drop down on the New Year resolutions and, and the decisions and the goals we set is because we don't see progress fast enough. The word progress is always attached to fast. That's the kind of world we are living in. We live in an instant world. We live in an Instagram world. We live, you know, everything needs to happen immediately and quickly. If you're slow, you're not good. You're not efficient. Everything needs to happen. But how does it work in our everyday life? We decide to, you know, uh, 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 you know start new habits and we try for a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months. And when you don't see a progress that you expect to see, and it's not according to your pace, then what you do is you make a wrong conclusion. And this is the wrong conclusion that you make. You think that small good decisions that you make don't matter that much. This is, this is your conclusion. This is what you're concluding. You know what they say? For your brain to even register that you have started a new habit, it takes six weeks of consistent practice of doing it. Not to even make it a habit, just, to, just for your brain to register that you, have, you are now serious about gym. You are now serious about giving up on junk food. And you need to be consistent about it day in and day out for six weeks non-stop. Only then your brain will register, okay, this guy is serious about starting a new habit. Then you continue. How many of us have had a non-stop consistent six weeks of Bible reading? That's a month and a half. How many of us have a simple habit of non-stop praying day in and day out? For six weeks. You don't have to answer me. Ask yourself. We become what we train ourselves to be. If we don't put this habit in place, the goal that you write down, I want to increase my prayer life, will just be on papers. What are we putting in place? Don't conclude wrongly that 
the small good decisions that you make don't matter that much because the moment you conclude that you are also concluding uh, coming into another wrong conclusion and the other wrong conclusion is small bad decisions also don't matter that much because when you're not making good decisions you're making bad decisions if you decided to become healthy and you're eating junk food that's a bad decision if you've decided to pray and increase your prayer life but you're spending time more on your mobile phone that's a bad decision so if you think that small good decision is not bringing any changes then small bad decisions is also not bringing big differences in my life is what you're thinking but actually it is those small bad decisions that you constantly make piles up in your life it becomes a storage and one day is where we have this breaking point and we cry out to god lord where is my life are you even there and god is like i am where you left me what are we doing it's the thing is the things that no one sees that brings the results that everyone wants success is not so much about what happens on the outside and what everybody is praising for is the things that you do when nobody sees you when nobody praises you when there's no one cheering for you when you keep doing those things constantly that is what will bring the result that everyone wants Galatians 6:9 it says let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up let us not grow weary in following Jesus let us not grow weary in praying let us not grow weary in reading God's word let us not grow weary in sharing the good news let us not grow weary in serving god but keep on doing what god has called you to do and you will see the big result that god has in store for you and the third thing and the third thing that we fail to see and the mistake that we make is our distorted identity sabotages our success our distorted identity sabotages our success most of the time this is where the enemy you know tries to take away that habit that you're trying to develop tries to take away that spiritual discipline that you're trying to develop this is where the enemy hits you really hard because what he does is that you know he will connect your failure to your identity he will say because you're fa- you have failed in this you are a failure he connects your failure to your identity the moment you connect your failure to your identity you start living in that identity you will start thinking that's who you are a lot of times people give up on spiritual discipline because they failed once they failed twice they fell down into that temptation and then they get up saying maybe this is who i am maybe this is who i am a lot of times people say this phrase the reason they say this is because the enemy connects the moment of weakness into their identity everybody who was used by god in the bible they all did this moses said i'm not a good speaker i can't speak gideon said i'm the weakest in my clan everybody pointed out their weakness paul said i am least and unworthy they all connected their you know their goals with their weakness and their weakness was rooted in their identity but this morning what god is trying to do is to take away all those things that is you know just becoming a cluster in your identity god wants to clear those things one by one 
and he wants to shape you and he wants you to know that you are rooted in Christ Jesus. Your identity doesn't come out of your actions. In fact, your actions comes out of your identity. Who you are in Christ, that will determine what you do for God. Write this down. An unhealthy identity creates unwise habits. An unhealthy identity creates unwise habits. Again, write this down. Unwise habits reinforces an unhealthy identity. It's a cycle. The moment you think you're not good enough, because you were not able to do something the way maybe your professor or your family member expected you to do it, you immediately think you are not good enough. The moment you think that you are not good enough and this is who you will be, you start keep on doing and you'll start doing good enough stuff in your life. And the more and more good enough stuff you start doing, the more and more unwise decisions you make. The more and more unwise decisions you make, the more and more you start believing that is who you are. You see how this works as a cycle? God wants to break that cycle. God wants to break that cycle out of your life. I want to encourage you this morning. Before writing down, most of the times when we write down goals, we write down what we want to do. Am I correct? You write, your focus is on the do. We're going to do something different. Is that okay? Today, we're going to write down not do goals. We're going to write down who goals. Our focus is not going to be on the do's. Our focus is going gonna, is gonna to be on the who I'm going to become. If my who is sorted, my do will take care of itself. Am I making sense? If you can understand who you are in Christ Jesus, if you can understand the plans that God has for your life and how and what you need to do in order to get close to Jesus, if you can keep discovering who you are, then your do's will be taken care. Don't focus on, oh, I need to give up on drinking. I need to give up on cigarette. I need to give up on pornography. I need to give up on uh, my, uh, my overspending. If you're going to keep focus on those things, what you're telling yourself is that I'm a smoker, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an overspender, and that keeps turning into your identity. But if you can focus on, I am a child of God. I am called to be righteous because my God is a righteous God. I have a heavenly father who loves me so there is love in my life. I have a heavenly father who says I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you and to give you hope. So which means I have a hopeful life. Because I have a loving father, because I have a, a life that is going to be hopeful, I don't need to be addicted to smoking or drinking or pornography or overspending because I have a father who is righteous you see how this works we don't focus on the do first we focus on the who first who do you want to become instead of you know writing down what you want to do when you go home this uh, this morning this afternoon after lunch maybe take some time and write down who you want to become Romans chapter 6 verse 6 7 and 18 it says that we know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. This is who we are. Because Jesus was crucified on the cross, sin has no power over our life. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and you have become slaves to righteous living. God has promised us a life of freedom and he wants you to be set free. He wants you to be overcomer, not to be, uh, to be victimized by your past and not to be fearful of the present and not to be anxious about the future. But in everything, go to God in prayer. 
Because that's who your God is. That's what Jesus did. He kept on going back to the Father in prayer. So there is freedom as we continue to shape our identity in Christ Jesus. Who you are will shape your actions. So our relationship with God and going deeper with God is so much more important. Develop healthy habits that will create a positive identity in your life. Who do you want to become? Just for the sake of imagination, I want all of us to close your eyes for two minutes. All of us to close our eyes for two minutes. I want you to go with me in this journey of imagination. You see a beautiful church. There's a lot of cars parked outside. You see a lot of people dressed in suits. They're walking into the church. You enter the church and you realize there's a funeral service happening. There's a coffin placed near the pews and you are walking towards the coffin. And so many people are coming there to attend this person's funeral to honor this person's life. As you get close to the coffin, I want you to stay with me in this imagination. As you get close to the coffin, you decide to take a look into the coffin to see who is dead. And you are shocked because you are inside the coffin. It's you. And you see so many people walking around you. And you see so many people out there who are crying and moaning. And as the pastor invites some of your members of the family or somebody of your relatives and friends to come and give a eulogy about you, about the life that you live. And you are hearing them speak about your legacy. If you can attend your own funeral and if you want to hear people speak a legacy about you, what would it be? I want you to think about it for a minute. What would people say about you? Or what do you want people to say about you? If you've thought about it, you can open your eyes. Why are you people so sad? Is it because you went to your own funeral? What came to your mind? Whatever came to your mind, take time to write it down now. Write it down. Whatever came to your mind that you want people to say about you. For example, this is Reverend Sam Ellis. What, I, what do I want people to say about me at my funeral? Probably I'm not living that life right now. But I aspire to become that. What is it that I aspire to become? Write it down. You can write it down. You can write it down, even if it's one word or two words or three words, you can write it down. This is your who. This is your life goal. For example, for me, you could say he was a guy who loved God. He's a guy who loved his family. He was a great husband, a great dad. 
a devoted pastor to his church. He was a strong leader who developed people and believed in people. He was a wise steward of everything that God has blessed him with. And he enjoyed his life with everything that God had blessed him with. This is something simple that I wrote it down when I came to my mind. What is it, what is it that you wrote down? You can, write, you can write it down. Have you done it? So this is your who. When you know your who, now you know what you want to do. Now you can prioritize your, you know, your life according to this. If this is the kind of legacy that you want to live, if this is the kind of legacy you want to leave back for your children, for the future, it's time we work towards that. But in the Bible, there's the greatest, you know, life goal that we could have, the greatest inspiration that we could all follow, the greatest standard that one person has set, that is Jesus Christ. There's one thing that I would like to decide as my life goal, that would be to become like Jesus. To become like Jesus. In everything that we do, are we able to transform, you know, be, uh, be transformed by what Christ has done? Are we able to follow Jesus and lead like Jesus in everything that we do? Your who needs to come before your do. Amen. Let's take a moment. We can close our Bibles and leave your notes aside. If you believe that God spoke to you this morning, and if you want to make a decision, so far you've been focusing on all the do's, all the things that you want to do, 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 and you've been giving up on it. But today God spoke to you saying, first decide on who you want to become. And maybe during that time when we were imagining together, maybe the Holy Spirit spoke something in your heart. And if that's what you want to become, we would like to pray for you.